Good afternoon, everybody. Well, thank you very much. I think that's the first time we actually got a response, so I appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here on this lovely day. Uh, despite my best efforts, no one would take me up on skipping this and going playing around the golf somewhere. So yeah, that's uh, right, people. Uh, that is apparently true. But uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and I also want to congratulate you all for making it this far with me. Um, we are rounding the bend on the home stretch and, and heading for the gate. So uh, I want to thank you all for your continued participation and your attention and your willingness to hear what I have to say and engaging with me. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, some recommended strategies for this community to move forward with its economic development. If you remember from the last time I was here in town, uh, we, I presented what I call the implementation framework, which is very much, uh, to be very as, as concise as I can, the menu, if you will, the choices of all the recommendations based on the goals that we have established through this strategy. So hopefully all of you remember that conversation from last time. And if you weren't here, you did your homework and, and watched my video, which I would appreciate if you did. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, we got a lot of I got a lot of feedback from the working group, from the community in terms of here's the things I would I wish we would focus on first, second, and third. And so taking that with the budget request that the EDP just came out with recently, I came up with a strategy of if Kyle were made king of the day, how would I pursue the next 12 months for economic development? And so tonight I'm going to present to you my recommendations on prioritizing the actions that we talked about the last time we were together. I'm going to start off by framing the conversation. Some of these slides we've already seen, but I think it's important to set the understanding of as we move forward. I'll walk you through the recommended 12-month plan, and then I'm going to walk you through what happens with life after Kyle. Because as, as much as I have enjoyed my time here in Danville Boyle County, sadly it is coming to an end soon. And hopefully economic development implementation will last well beyond the conclusion of this contract. So with that, let's jump into it. And this is one, if you were here last time, you've seen before. But it's to understand the difference between what we are doing, which is creating a strategic plan, and then what comes next, which is the establishment of your 12-month business plan. What I'm going to be providing at the end of this, the document that you will all read when you have insomnia problems, is the menu. The items of all the different things, things you said you wanted to do, here are all the different actions that you should want to be taking. You need to create your business plan and say, okay, Kyle recommended these 127 different action items. We can only focus on 20 right now. What are the 20 that we're going to go ahead and do? You're going to get my recommendation of what those are, but at the end of the day, you as a community have to define what that initial business strategy is. And a lot of that is because the menu is of all the items. If you think of it as a menu in a restaurant, there's nine appetizers and 15 entrees and, and seven desserts, and you're not going to go in and order all. The reality is you only have a certain amount of money to be able to buy your dinner, and so you're going to pick your appetizer, your entree, and your dessert, and you're going to move forward with those. And so we, I recognize when I look at the current funding level for the EDP, and I look at even the requested funding level for the EDP, it is not sufficient to do everything all at once. And then the reality is it'll probably be very, very challenging to try and implement everything all at once. And so we're, I'm going to help you strategize, prioritize, and so that as you build your uh, momentum within economic development and you decide, hey, this is going really, really great, we should start thinking about doing that other thing Kyle talked about. You're doing it in a strategic and digestible form. Like I mentioned when we first started talking is after the last presentation about the framework, we got a lot of feedback about prioritization. Uh, we got it from elected officials, from our working group members, and key stakeholders. A lot of folks uh, responded back and said, if, if this were up to me, here's what I would be doing. The, the two main takeaways that I got from that, the first is there were over 20 different action items that were identified as the most important ones based on the feedback that I received. That's significant from the standpoint of it, it, ex it exposes the diversity that we have here in this community and the fact that we are going to have to be judicious in how we implement this. It also, from a very sobering perspective, is telling that we're not going to be able to do everything that everybody wants. And we're going to have to be able to pick and choose and be okay with the fact that some things that some folks want aren't going to be the first things we do out of the gate. And that's okay. That's typical. That's normal when you do the, these sorts of strategies because this is everything. We then have to be more mindful. 
What it does say, though, is as the community, the Economic Development <coughs> Partnership and its partner entities get into making those choices, you should be doing it with a strategy in mind of why we are trying to go that way. When you see my final document, which is intended to be delivered over the next 30 days, is there's a lot of explanation that's in there about why we're making, why these recommendations are re relevant and why we're making this recommendation over maybe something else. And so hopefully that will be helpful as you guys go through that process. But it was very, very telling just in the brief feedback we got after the last meeting. The second uh, big data point we got are the five actions that received the most attention, the most frequent response saying, this is what's important to us. And to read them very quickly, as you know, I often don't read, but I think it's important for me to read it this time is, workforce enhancement coordination, expanded recruitment efforts, improve internal and external marketing and outreach, reorganize the EDP for success, and staff the reorganized entity to broaden our efforts. So within each of those one, I, I, I hope they are self-explanatory. The one that I wanted to focus on the most was the final one, which is staff, uh, the, the reorganized entity broaden our efforts. If you've seen one of my videos, you've been here before, you've heard me say, our expectations for economic development do not match our physical and financial capacity that we've implemented for economic development. We have a very focused effort right now because we have a very limited resource pool in which to go after it. I think through this process, more people, more and more people are recognizing that if we want to broaden economic development and what that means for our community is, we're going to have to bring more people on board and we're going to have to invest more money into it, which I believe the, the Economic Development Partnership has recognized in the most recent budget request. And I will say, as a shout out to them, I find their stewardship of saying, rather than trying to do it all at once, let's make the next logical step and then we can talk later on down the line once we start proving our worth for that first investment. I think that's a very appropriate way to go and I think it's a very wise strategic, which uh, for all uh, uh, honesty was not anything to do with me. That was something that the organization came up with on its own. So all that being said is the feedback that I received throughout this entire process and since the last meeting, the budget requests and what that would enable the organization to do really is what defined this 12-month strategy. I said, okay, if those are my resources and that's my capacity, what would I do with that over the next 12 months? So I, I broke it down by the, uh, as best I could by the five different categories that I mentioned. So the first one was workforce. And I think the first thing off the bat is get um, the workforce efforts that are being done right now out of the Chamber of Commerce and into the EDP. And I must apologize, uh, you see the DVDC up there and I'm getting confused looks. I have renamed your economic development organization. Uh, unilaterally, I've changed it for you. You'll get the uh, uh, State Corporation Commission filings in a matter of days now. Uh, no, I'm, I'm joking about the second part of it. But I have recommended a name change. Partly is because I want it to be more reflective of, the, of what this new organization's mission is, and we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit, but also the fact that it's a good optic to say, look, we, we are evolving this. We are changing and moving forward. Whether or not you call it the Danville Oil Development Corporation, which is what the DBDC stands for, or something else is immaterial to me. It's a recommendation that I think a name change would be appropriate. You're gonna hear me say DBDC because this is my presentation and that's just the way it's gonna go for tonight. But I will say this is something that the community should consider, strongly consider, especially with the EDP partner members, and, and, and think about what that next new name, next name is. So that being said, transfer those efforts out of the Chamber of Commerce into the, 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 the Economic Development Organization. And you'll hear me saying in a bit, you know, we need to focus what that organization's mission is. And I'll get to that in just a little while. Working with the Chamber for a smooth transition, um, we, you, you saw in the budget request for a chief operating officer, we strongly encourage you to do that. If you want the EDP or you want this organization to broaden its horizons, it's going to need more bodies. You have one, I would argue, one and a quarter employees right now in the Economic Development Partnership, and that's just not sufficient to do everything that we want economic development to do for our community. So you need to have that other body, and this would be one of those responsibilities. And then, but, in reality is, there is already a lot of momentum going on in workforce development. How do we transition that board, those individuals that have a strong interest in it, and bring them into this fold rather than saying, hey, thanks for your service, We're, we got this now. This is not about claiming territory or defining you know, borders. It's 
this is more appropriate from a staffing and from a financial capacity standpoint to be done through the EDP organization and not through a chamber of commerce. Uh, create an education workforce task force. This is where you bring your, your, your public schools, your, community, your technical college center, business leaders, and regional state partnerships together and start coming up with solutions for the problems. We have been very, very good at identifying a lot of the problems that we have. Now is, okay, how do we then take the issue that we're trying to bring in these businesses and they have these employment needs, how do we then create programs that we can start saying we are going to be producing staff to fill those jobs? It's how do we become more strategic in that? There's been a lot of talk, for example, around uh, the issue around trying to deal with the drug issue in the community. And how do we provide alternatives for folks or help them when they go through rehab find jobs? That's very commendable, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But that's yet one again is let's bring all the partners together in a room and talk about solutions rather than talking about the challenge. And coming up and saying, okay, schools, what can you do to help? Okay, uh, uh, BCTC, what can you do to help? All right, center, what's on your plate? All right, economic development, what's your responsibility? And so that's what the, imp the impetus of this is. It, for those of you who are aware, we. Um, did a business survey for the first time ever here in the community. We're encouraging you to continue to do that. You'll get feedback from the businesses of, I can't find people who can do this, or I need more people who can do that. That should be part of that workforce task force trying to find solutions of how to address their needs. Um, I know that uh, there's been a lot of talk about Joe Max Higgins from uh, Mississippi, the Golden Triangle, if you saw that on 60 Minutes. But one of the things I took from when I saw that is their technical college creates customized workforce programs for each recruit they bring into the community. That's a type of proactive discussion that should be going on with this task force. Create a one-stop uh, uh, shop for marketing materials. A lot of the information about what's currently available, and frankly, if you remember, I said this last time, you guys have a lot of resources available to you, but it's not easily accessible. And it's not very or organized in a manner that if I wanted to go find out what workforce programs you have for my company, what it is, who to talk to, and how to get it. And so one of the recommendations over the next 12 months is get more organized. And you'll hear that as a theme for your economic development website in a number of different areas, is how to make it more user-friendly and how to make more content-based. Having a link to a PDF that lists all the programs is not as effective as here are the five programs with a description and then a link to the organization that runs that program so that you can get more information. It just makes it easier on the user. Implement your first annual job fair. I talked about this last time. This is, we've seen communities be very, very effective. If you want your residents to know what's available to them, get your companies together, have them say, these are the types of jobs we have, these are the types of reopens we have, and most importantly, here's how much you can make, and here's what it takes for you to get that job, and here are some of the limitations. If you can't pass a drug test, we can't hire you because of ABC. Start putting that, what I call the light at the end of the tunnel. If you give me an option, an alternative, that says if I do this, that, or the other, then I have a chance in six to 12 months I can be making X amount of dollars, that gives me a choice, rather than saying, well, there's really nothing out there for me. So this is one of those efforts to be more proactive. Uh, working with BT, BCTC on capacity expansion, there, there was a grant, I believe the community's gone after, you could still continue to try and build capacity, but how can, the economic development organization bring together businesses with BTCT to find ways to fund some of those things by the companies that are going to benefit from those programs. There's a lot of opportunity out there, and there's actually already companies that are investing in workforce programs because they know it helps them. How can we formalize that, expand it, make it more of a mission under economic development? And then finally, partnering, partnering with the Substance Abuse Task Force where, where appropriate. I think it is valuable that your economic development organization hear and understand what's going on. But I will say, you see it up here, and I don't have a laser pointer, in fact, even if I do, I, I can't point to it, but is your ED efforts in this should be focused squarely on workforce. It's not their job to deal with compliance, healthcare, policy. That's not what your economic development organization is doing. They should be working with these organizations to identify best practices and implement ways to provide alternatives for folks going through treatment or before folks need treatment so that they can be, be take advantage of this economic development success that we're trying to drive here. So I do believe they should be more engaged, but I think they should be engaged specifically on what their mission is. And let the healthcare professionals, for example, figure out the treatment strategies. That's that's not in their bailing. Under recruitment, excuse me. Uh, under recruitment, 
is the first one is consolidate prioritize your target industry list. Your target industry list right now is about 15 to 20 different industries. And I strongly encourage you as a community to be open more than closed and, and be open to any sort of interest in the community is. If I'm going to invest our resources, let's drill down. I like to call it, I prefer the rifle approach over the shotgun approach. If we get very, very good at one or two or three industries, we're going to be a lot more successful than if we try and do all 12. Because you can't become an expert and you just don't have the bandwidth as a community to become expert in 12 different. So let's focus on the ones we think are going to be most successful. From RKG's perspective, advanced manufacturing, logistics, health services, and health products, I think are the three that I would focus on. You as a, as a community, you as an EP need to decide if you agree with that or not. But at the end of the day, is you should pick one or two or three and just drive for those. And then focus your recruitment trips on those sectors. Uh, implement your first on-site recruitment effort. Uh, we are very, very good at going out to uh, conferences or events and, and meeting with prospects. There's a lot of value to bring them to the community and showing them what uh, Danville Boyle County has to offer. Uh, it's been said to me, and I frankly agree, that this community fights above its weight in a lot of different aspects of life. You have an internationally renowned college here, for example. You are a stone's throw from Lexington. There's a lot of quality of life here to sell to a community that a site selector is not going to get on a web-based search. Bringing businesses here and showing them what they can have is equally as important. We, our recommendation is, over the next year, try and do your first on-site recruitment. Identify some companies or one or two and bring them here and give them the two-day dog and pony show. Maybe tie it around brass band or around the barbecue festival so they can see the, everything the community has to offer, but let's, let's open up that opportunity for ourselves. Continue to, and then, but continue to ride her on regional and state efforts. I would argue that uh, Jody and EDP have been very, very good at taking advantage of the region of the state and paying a good portion of his cost to go be part of these recruitment trips. You should continue to do that. It's a cost-effective way to get your name out there and take advantage of what the, the state and regional organizations are doing. I will say, though, that if there are four of them, I would want you to pick the one that's either in one of the three target areas rather than just pick one for the sake of picking one. So being more strategic about it, I'm not saying that he's not. I'm just saying that as that becomes a decision point, look at what's available to you and then pick the one that drives in that specialty that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, Implement the telecommute slash quality of life recruitment strategy. If you remember from the last time, this is where we were talking about people who don't necessarily have to be in their company offices, can live anywhere they want, work. Once again, you have a tremendous opportunity here, a community that, that almost sells itself, frankly, for people who are looking for that lifestyle that goes well above, above your, your population numbers. This is one, though, where you're going to be focusing on your regions, your Louisville's, your Cincinnati's, Nashville's, Memphis. You're not going to pull a lot of people out of D.C. I mean, that's just a reality. To, to spend money to go to D.C., the lobby, the K Street law firm, to say, why don't you move your paralegals out here, is going to be a lot harder of a, of, a, of a sell than going into Cincinnati and saying, hey, you don't have to have all those folks here. We're just two hours south, and, and the cost of living, and, you're, and you don't even have to pay them as much because they can get just as good or not a better lifestyle for less money. There's a lot of value to that in terms of selling that part of it. That's one thing we're not really doing right now. Pursue transportation focused economic development. We have that airport out there and I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again. You, you reach the magic number of 5,000 feet of runway which allows you to land jets. That opens up all sorts of different economic development opportunities than your, your traditional general aviation airport. Um, this is one where you think the partnership with Lincoln County would benefit you the most because they have a lot more undeveloped land surrounding the airport than you do. But this is one where we see a, a lot of potential for the community to try and target those transportation base. And this ties into that logistics. Not every company moves things by a truck. Sometimes they move it by rail, sometimes they move it by air. We have the, the Norfolk Southern Rail Head right here. We got the airport. We're not terribly far from the interstate. That, that makes for a compelling argument to a logistics company. And then finally is continue to build your relationships within the industry. This is something that you're already doing very, very well. You're building your relationship with the ADD. You're building relationships with the state and with site selectors. I put this in here strictly to say this is not all new stuff. A lot of these recommendations are things that you're already doing and doing quite well. Is But I don't want the stuff that we're doing to be lost in the polls saying, well, Kyle said do this, that, and the other. He didn't say keep doing that. It's important that the stuff that we are successful at, that we continue to do and continue to uh, pursue. In terms of retention, this is where is, we're not doing a whole lot of right now and we want to see you do more of. And this is a capacity bandwidth issue, but I think if we implement this funding strategy, we have the ability to do that. 
The business survey, I think, is one of the areas that produces a substantial amount of information for a very little investment. You had, ben, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 84 respondents for this first go-round, which is actually pretty good. I will say it's pretty good because the first one is always the most challenging. But when, when the businesses realize what you're using this for and they see how this is driving your strategies, you're going to have a lot more responses the next time, and the next time, and the next time. And this is, has benefits in two ways. One I already mentioned, which is you'll get a lot of information saying, this business is saying it's about to close, or we learned that in the retail industry, everyone's downsizing. So maybe we need to get the retailer together and talk about why this is going on and see how we can intervene. The second thing is, is that it allows you to start tracking responses from various industries based on economic cycles. And as you do this over time, you'll almost be able to predict what the next thing is going to happen based on what's going on in the economy. And so rather than waiting for retailers to tell you once a year that they're struggling, you can say, oh, we just saw this is going on. We better organize them now and figure out how we can get out in front of it. It's a tremendous tool. SurveyMonkey, which is the company that I use to do my online survey, I know it sounds funny, but it's quite effective, is I think it's uh, $200 a year or 26 bucks a month for membership that you don't even have to keep. Once you do it, you keep it for two or three months, you do your survey and you get out of it. For 50 bucks a year, this is a no-brainer in terms of collecting data. Uh, and then you can use that information to implement, well, you need to implement your business retention. Right now you do very good with the industrial members of your community, you need to do with everybody. When, as you get more bandwidth, you can get out and talk to these businesses. Your survey is a great way to say, we heard from these companies that said, yeah, come talk to me because I'm having problems, or I need to grow and I can't find space. So it helps you be more strategic about it, but you need to get out and talk to your businesses. You're gonna get a lot more job growth for your dollar in expansion of existing companies than you will what it will cost you to bring a company here to the community. And so getting more engaged and getting more involved in that I think is gonna be very, very important. And then increased communication with your key property owners is how do we, the folks that have our assets, uh, contrary to some belief in this community, the Industrial Foundation doesn't own everything that is being marketed for economic development, and how do we get those other folks to the table and get them understanding what our needs are and working with them to, to make their properties more marketable? Believe it or not, when a prospect is looking at it, they want to know how much the land's going to cost. They don't want to say negotiable. That does not do anything for them. Because is it five grand an acre? Is it 50 grand an acre? And a lot of times they're making those types of decisions before they ever even reach out to the community. So that's just an example of, with your retention efforts, is sometimes people need more space. And whether you're talking to an existing shopping center owner that has vacancy and finding out what their plans are, or someone who's a piece of land that is, has the potential to be invested in to make the space that someone can't find here, it's important to have those relationships before you need something out of them. You've heard me say this before if you've done one of these meetings, you gotta build the relationships before you build the partnerships. When I show up hat in hand asking you for a handout, that has a lot, carries a lot different weight than when I come to you and say, I want to help you, let's talk about this. And when I have something that, that I know fits your bill, then let's, we'll be able to move forward with it. Marketing and outreach. And I already mentioned this once, I'm not going to belabor the point. Enhance your economic development website to be more user friendly. One thing I will say is the, the community content section, if you remember from the last time I talked about community engagement, and I'm going to say that a lot, my videos online. I think it's got what like eight hits. I'm like a YouTube sensation now. <laughs> is is you can you can go back and hear what we talked about that last time. But a lot about it is trying to educate the community and saying this is what economic development is. I made the point this morning uh, with the EDB board, and and it's it's sadly true. Is uh, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, and if I brought my parents into this room and asked them to explain to you what I did for a living, they would struggle mightily. And I've been doing this for 20 years. My point of that is economic development is not intrinsically natural knowledge that people have. You have to educate them on what it is, why you need to do it, what benefits do they get out of it. And so having that community content piece as part of your website is as much important as your outreach that we're going to talk about in just a moment as it is um, the, the actual meetings that you hold with them. Uh, create more comprehensive marketing materials. This is just blocking what I call block and tackling stuff. If you're a football fan, you know your your game is won and lost on on the lines. You know your quarterback's not going to do anything. Be Tim Couch to use a Kentucky reference, but if he's getting sacked 12 times a game, he's not getting anything done for him. And so, stuff like having materials is very very important. And so this is just a recommendation of let's formalize though both in print and in digital so that it's getting as much outreach as possible. Implement broader community outreach efforts. And I, I've labored this 
regular updates to your elected bodies, attending and giving a presentation every two or three months, every month. This is what we're doing, this is what we accomplished. Isn't that great? A monthly e-newsletter and an op-ed to the newspaper talking about all the successes we had. When I served as a chairperson of an economic development organization back where I live, I created what we called the Mile Post, which was a monthly e-newsletter that my organization sent out. We were a seven mile long stretch of highway. So we were, we were measured by what mile post along the highway you were is what the economic development strategy was. And so, um, but that built awareness of what was going on within the community, saying, oh, they're not just sitting there, you know, twiddling their thumbs going, ha, 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 we got all this money from the public sector, they're actually doing things for us. And so you need to get that out there. Um, target HOAs and community groups for outreach meetings. It's not enough to say they should come to us if they have questions. That's not how life works. We are Americans. We expect everything to be delivered to us. And so as an economic development organization that's trying to build awareness in your community, you should be reaching out and saying, hey, uh, Kiwanis, for example, we want to come present and let you know what's been going on for the past year and all the things that we've accomplished. And I think that is very, very important uh, part of trying to build that community outreach, trust, and understanding. And then finally, an annual town hall meeting. It doesn't hurt to sit down and say, anyone who wants to come in here and talk about what we've been doing, what we're about to do, and ask questions, we open, the, open our doors for you. Assets. Um, develop a more comprehensive property and asset database. This goes back to talking to your property owners. The reality is, when we first started doing this project, and, and if you remember Lauren uh, from earlier on the project, Lauren and I started doing our research, we recognize the fact that there's a, for example, one property that's advertised at three different locations with three different price points. That is a killer when you're a prospect and you're interested in that property because I don't know what the price is. So something as simple as working to make sure that all those different marketing efforts are being done consistently is important. But like I mentioned earlier, this is where you start talking to property owners and further to prospect to know what they want, what their expectations are. So when, when I come in and say, I want to build a widget factory, I know that Ben doesn't want manufacturing on his land, he wants it to be retail. So I know not to go bother Ben about that prospect because it's not going to happen. <clears throat> and then when Ben says, hey, how come you didn't sell my property? I said, well, they said manufacturing and you told me you didn't want that. And so it, it builds that dialogue so you know what you have and what you can offer as the prospects are interested in and then sell that out before they even call you. Integrate smart growth strategies and asset development. I think this is a no-brainer, but I felt important enough to say because I know it's important to the community, is we have capacity to grow within the areas that have already been identified for growth uh, within our community. Let's focus on filling that stuff up before we start tapping into the other stuff. I will say on the other side of that coin though, and it's going to be very, very clear, you can't say what we have now is all we're ever going to have. You have to also identify those areas where in the future is our 20-year plan, our 40-year plan, our 60-year plan. It is a balance, and it's a balance. That's what smart growth is. It's not no growth, it's not unbridled growth, it's smart growth. And we want to make sure that in this plan, we're clear, we, we espouse those, those realities. So let's focus on using the resources we have now and then identify those resources in the future so there's no confusion. Uh, continue to work to seek best practices on approval processes. And, and, and no, no, uh, 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 um, not bad-mouthing anyone is the reality is there's always ways to improve. There's always ways for me to improve. What I do is always ways to improve to be as a community can do and constantly looking for new ways to make the approval process, the development process more streamlined. And if you ever work with someone in the real estate industry, predictability and consistency. If I know how long it's gonna take me to get an approval and I know I have to go through the same process every time, that's the best. Once there's uncertainty and once there's, once there's uh, uh, Unpredictability, that's when it becomes very, very challenging. So finding ways to get from concept to yes as quickly as possible within the best interest of the community is always a good goal to have. Develop market formulaic local incentive thresholds. And you heard me talk about this last time. The, the best thing you can do as a community is to say, if you bring us this, we will give you that. And we have to move up. That's the strategy. Now you can be as specific or general as you want. You can make it industry specific. So if I'm bringing in a dry cleaner, this is what I'm willing to do. If I'm bringing in a manufacturer, this is what I'm willing to do. And you can frankly say, we don't incent those kinds of businesses too. That's completely okay as well. But creating that formulaic strategy, and particularly from your public sector bodies saying, if you give us this, then we are willing to talk about that is the best way to market before they come to you. I said this before and I'll say it again. 90% of all prospects 
look at your community and rule you out before you ever even know they exist. And having the information available to them as they're doing their research puts you in a competitive advantage position of knowing what's on the table for them to come after. And so having that information in place and, and in print will be an asset to your implementation. Expand, or expand or excuse me, create a broadband expansion strategy. I know it's time for a thing. Uh, this has been kicked around this community for quite a while. And if you've heard me talk before, you know I talk very directly. And it's not meant to be insulting or, or derogatory, but you see why you hired me. You've been talking about it a long, long time. It's time to organize the entities that are going to be the investors in making that happen and come up with a plan. <coughs> I can't say that I know what that plan is. I'm not a telecommunications expert. But I can say that it's from an economic development standpoint, it's a tremendous asset to have. But talking about it is not going to get you there. You can continue to talk about it forever. Let's get the investing partners that need to be at the table and, and come up with a strategy. And I think that's something that, that you should do. Uh, perform a feasibility analysis for some potential opportunities. These came out through the research. Your indoor outdoor athletic competition sports complex. We are in a great location. and. As our hotel and accommodations expand, there's a lot of opportunity there. There are companies that specifically will tell you this is how much it'll cost and this is what you'll get out of it. Then you can make an informed decision as a community whether or not you want to make that investment. Agritourism Exposition Center, there's a, there's, a, there's a hole in the market here in this area for something like that. Once again, not a specialty that I have, but it's, it's, a, it's an assessment that communities should do to determine whether or not it's an investment you want to make. And I know I sound like I'm self I, I am creating more work for myself and companies like myself, but I put it to you this way. You're going to spend anywhere from ten dollars to $30,000 to get somebody to come in and tell you whether or not this is a good idea. That's a lot better than spending five to $10 million to find out that it's a bad idea. And so from my perspective, as, you're, uh, as, as your advisor is, it's a small investment to make sure you're going to get the return that you think you're going to get out of that, out of that, out of that action. Work with the bypass. Uh, property owners consider a bid concept. This is one where let's let the businesses help themselves. It is working with them to understand that it's a self tax if you don't know what a business improvement district, but 100% of that money is earmarked to be spent in that area. And so most of the times it's property owners that say, yes, I'm willing to tax myself a little bit as long as I know all that money is being spent to make improvements for my area where I do business. And so the bypass is a commercial corridor, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's a reality, but there's always room for improvement. And how do we work with the business owners to help leverage our public dollars to make that happen? Activate your community to help with economic development. It's, this is not the responsibility of the EDP or the BCDC or the whatever John you were calling it earlier. Um, the reality is, is everybody has a role in economic development. And, and we talked about these before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But the two I want to focus on are advocates and ambassadors. Advocates are citizens that understand and support economic development and help bring the word out to the community. Ambassadors typically are business leaders that help you with recruitment and retention. Developing those folks in this community will go a long way, not only from the education process to get people to understand what economic development is, but to build credibility for economic development. These are easily things you can do at very low cost over the next 12 months to help build awareness within your community of what economic development is and how it benefits them. Administrative, maybe this should have been the first one. In hindsight, it's 2020, maybe talking about the, the, uh, excuse me, the DBDC would have been better if I would have explained this earlier. But, oh well, I jumped the shark a little bit, so I apologize about that. Rebranding the organization, I think, is something that is a no-brainer from my perspective. Uh, centralized staff and, and, impl and implementation to, the, to this organization. There's a lot of unnecessary confusion about how economic development decisions are made in your community. And in reality, it's, it's, a, it's a simple fix. You, you have an economic development entity. The administration and, and implementation of that should be through that economic development entity. And so from our, my perspective is, let's, let's do that. Let's try and organize, say, our, all our employees are employed by this organization, and all decisions are made by this board. I'm going to show you my recommendation of what this board looks like in just a moment. This is, the, I know this has been the big part of a lot of people's concern. I'm getting, I, I, I made it last on purpose because I didn't want anyone to leave until I was done. <laughs> so um, expand staffing of the ED effort, and I, I already talked about this. Hire the COO position that's been proposed already, uh, re and retain support services from your partner organization. Someone asked me earlier today, is it a good idea to try and do that, that, that 
that co-locating, if you will, or the, or the, the, the co-services from staff. Absolutely. Where that makes sense, I fully support it. However, where there's a need for a full-time staff, a part-time staff doesn't get it done. You know, I would love to. I would love to only parent my kids from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Sadly, the 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. part is part parcel of the job. That's usually when the worst things. If you ever have kids, you know that's usually when the worst things happen. Anyway, so you don't really, you can't do a full-time job on half time. It just doesn't work like that. And then reorganize the board of directors to diversify representation. I know this was a concern that was expressed throughout this. I don't disagree. I think we've come up with a recommendation that addresses that, that allows this organization to move forward. Before I show it to you, because now I have you on the edge of your seat, is I'm gonna tell you that this is our recommendation. All of these are our recommendations. You as a community ultimately will decide what that is. From my professional opinion, based on the feedback that I got, based on trying to position you to be as effective and as efficient in implementing economic development as possible, this is where I think you should go. Hopefully you understand the rationale behind what I'm saying. So as you make a decision on whether it's seven or eight or nine or 10 or blue or green, is secondary to the fact that you understand why I'm saying this is the direction that we should go. So with that being said, to Danville Royal Development Corporation, this slide is to show you from our perspective, we need to define economic development as the true core economic development missions. And that is recruitment, retention, expansion, workforce development, entrepreneurial development. <coughs> Those are the five things that your economic development entity should be doing and should be leading. That should be the responsibility of your economic development organization, the Danville Oil Development Corporation. Your, your partner organizations, the Chamber, the CBD, Main Street Parallel, and the Heart of Danville are very important partners, strategic partners in certain instances, but not all the time. And I think to define clarity, not just for our community, but for those organizations of who's supposed to be doing what, we are recommending that they truly become partner organizations and not part of the economic development partnership. You have up there private investors, your chairman's investors, for example, the Industrial Foundation, the county and the city, which are already investors, and that's why they're blue. But we also think that we should continue to leave the door open for Parallel Junction City to join in as well. I know that they, they may not be ready to do it right now, and they may not be ready to do it anytime soon. But I'm more of a leave the light on type of guy than close the door behind me type of guy. And if you truly want them to change their position, you have to let them know that they are welcome when they're ready to join. And I think, uh, and you'll see in terms of the board structure of how I go about doing that. But that's the reason why they're right, is because they're not quite there yet, but we want them to be there and the door, you know, my mind is open for them to do it. So the responsibilities I've already talked about from the economic development organization, the five core economic development missions. Not only does this simplify things, it makes it a very easy, much easier for the community to understand what their job is. If there's a pothole in the street, if there is a drug problem in the community, it is not the responsibility of the economic development entity to solve that. There may be a role for them to partner where it makes sense, if it has to do with business recruitment expansion or expansion or retention, workforce development or entrepreneurial development, but that is their focus and bailiwick. I'm not gonna belabor the other organizations, you all know what they do and what they're supposed to be doing, but from our perspective, allowing those organizations to be who they are will help alleviate a lot of some of the, I shouldn't say a lot, but some of the, the, the inner conflict that has gone on. There are times, for example, where the economic development entity and the heart of Danville will be lockstep, and there are times where the heart of Danville and the economic development entity will disagree. And that's okay. You need to have various perspectives bringing ideas to the table so that you can see all your different options and make a decision. We don't have to agree about everything. But when it makes sense, we have to be ready to work together. Now, there's a lot, and I talked about this last year together, there's a lot about it's not what we say, but how we say it that's going to need to be addressed so that this continue, can, can continue to get better and better. But the reality is, is disagreement doesn't mean disapproval. It just means you and I have a different perspective. Uh, I will tell you in my example, in my marriage, there's a lot of times my wife and I disagree. Surprisingly, I'm always the one who's wrong. But it doesn't mean that when we disagree, we don't also agree about a lot of other things too. And that's how it makes the relationship work, at least for us. So here you go. Um, I'm going to bring this with me. My apologies if this throws things off, but I have to stand out front of because this is a little bit hard to see. So the EDP board, what does that look like? Well, we, I believe, it's a total of 20 board seats. And up there in the corner, we have nine business community members, six of which are appointed ex officio by the Industrial Foundation, three of which are at-large members that are voted on by the board as a whole. 
And so we're going to try to get as broad of a business representation as we possibly can. You have the three chairman circle donors each get a seat in exchange for their continued support of economic development. City of Danville and Boyle County each will have three seats rec recognizing their investment in economic development and their importance, particularly from the policy and investment side of economic development. Perryville and Junction City, because in reality they're probably not going to be putting the type of resources up that the county and Danville are, will have one seat. And as you can see up there, it's contingent upon contingent upon funding. We recognize and appreciate the pay-to-play strategy. If you have money in the game, you're going to be a lot more vested in the outcome. You're going to be a lot more willing to work and partner and, and coordinate and collaborate. And so, once again, those seats are available. Um, if they come up with their funding, and, and that will be up to the board to decide what that threshold should be. <clears throat> Hopefully you all be reasonable about what that threshold will be and not say, oh, 50% of your budget, that's, that's your chair. But the reality is when they're ready to come and do that, then there's a seat that's sitting there for them to participate. Your four partner organizations, the Chamber of the Heart, Mason, <coughs> and the Chamber of Commerce will have appointed non-voting seats. They are an important part of economic development, but they are not economic development. They need to be able to come and participate and feel welcome. They need to know that when it makes sense, we're gonna to work together. But once again, to create better understanding and, and appreciation of what the economic development is and who's doing what, is having that, that distance, I think, is very, very important. The other thing about this is, and it's not up here, is we're recommending four executive seats, president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, Previously, those roles could only be held by the private sector. I don't see a reason why. Those seats should be voted on by the board as a whole. So who they think the best person to run, support, deal with the finances, and administer the administrative part of it, that's who it should be. If it's four people from the public sector, great. If it's four people from the private sector, great. If it's any mix in between, that's great too. Leadership shouldn't be determined based on where you come from. It should be determined based on your ability to make the organization more valuable. And so that's one of the things we wanted to get up there. The next thing here you see here is your organizational chart. You have your CEO, the recommended COO that the funding has been requested for. Over time, we believe to accomplish everything that's in the, the, the strategic plan and to be able to meet all the goals that you want to meet with the metrics that you want to have, you're going to need a third professional to support those two. An administrator, a part which we believe can be part-time, which is what it is now, is going to be valuable because you want someone dealing, you don't want your CEO having to deal with making sure your, your meeting on Tuesday is in your calendar. You, you outsource that to someone who can focus on that stuff, which is what should be their job. And then your CEO and COO would be working with your implementation partners, your focus groups and roundtables, which we talked about last time we were together, and then helping develop your ambassadors and advocates. <laughs> One thing I do want to point out here is, right now your CEO and COO responsibilities are that way because we're taking advantage of the, the technical capabilities of your existing CEO. One should be the outward focusing economic development, your recruitment, your out of the community. One should be your internal. From our assessment, we believe that Jody is substantially stronger in that outward economic development recruitment piece, and so as a CEO, that's what he should be doing. As I said this morning, I'll say again, not every, nobody's here forever. None of us are gonna be here forever. Someday, I won't be here, not just here in this community, but on earth. So my point of saying that is, is that those responsibilities can flip and flop depending upon the technical capacity and capabilities of the people in those seats. If your CEO happens to be the in-house person, then your COO should be the person who's doing all the external recruitment. It's not hard and fast that one has to be one and one has to be the other. It's we're trying to take advantage of the resources that we have available to us today and position them to be as successful as they can be. I'm going to now kind of crawl back into my hole here and continue on talking. So the recommended approach, life after Kyle. I know it's tragic. Uh, I'm sure the EDP will fund your uh, therapy sessions when I'm no longer here, but. Um, the reality is you guys need to be able to do this well beyond when I come when I leave town. So building for success. The two main things I want to leave you with here is one is implementation is a process and not an event. Economic development is a marathon and not a sprint. We have to implement our short-term plan, 
as we get into it, reassess changing market conditions, <laughs> changing community priorities, adapt to that change, and continue forward. But at the end of the day, you have to stay the course. If you're flipping and flopping every other year or every year, you are going to do more harm to yourself than good. Because you've created a vision as a community. I believe that we have done a good job, if I do say so myself, of trying to get as much feedback as we can to ensure that the goals and strategies that have been put forward re reflect the vision and desire of the community. You have to stay the course. If you constantly are moving and going tangential, you're, you're going, it's going to be a lot harder for you to see the success you want, and particularly to see the sustainability that you, you all should expect out of economic development investment. Second thing is, none of you will be as effective as all of you. We are a small community. I know we fight above our weight, and it is commendable, but the reality is, one of the things that's going to work for this community is to continue to have the public sector and the private sector, the citizens and the businesses coming together and implementing this as a team. Just from a resource perspective, why do we want to alienate one or multiple of those entities who are willing to put their blood, sweat, and money into the deal for no good reason? Where we're not going to see any additional success and it's just going to cost any one of our individual entities more money. So just from that base level, the reality is working together is going to be the best strategy that we have to have success. Keys to sustainability. Balance the needs of the market with the defined vision. Flexibility is important. We did an analysis as of late 2016, early 2017. I am not standing up here giving you a money back guarantee that in early 2018, the market isn't going to, the world isn't going to change and your opportunities haven't going to change. So you have to keep your eyes on what's going on, feedback from your target businesses, feedback from your focus groups, feedback from the business survey will help you constantly refine what that strategy should be as you move forward. But balance the needs of the market with the vision of the community. Once again, my strategy is going to have a lot of recommendations. It's not meant to you have to do it exactly the way I said. It's meant to say, here's, the, here's the, the, the concept of why we're trying to do this, and from our expert position, as of today, this is what we think is going to put you in the best position to be successful. Be strategic and not ad hoc. There will be a lot of tempting junk food out there. I've come to learn through this process that when I work communities, a lot of times the first few things that come out of the gate are what I call the, the um, I want to say it nicely, Ben. I don't want to say it the way I said it this morning. Huh? Are the opportunists. How about that? The people think that they're going to get a free ride because the community is all gung-ho and ready to move forward. You should not be taking the first thing that comes along because it's the first thing that comes along. Let's be strategic because what we put in the ground in this piece of land is going to have rippling effects on the next piece of land, the next piece of land, the next piece of land. And so let's stick to the vision. Let's be strategic and not try and make decisions in a vacuum. Let's look at how it fits in with our strategy so that we make sure that it's consistent, not just with the economic development plan, but the future growth plan and the smart growth plan. And then part of that is educate, educate, educate. I can't say this enough. When you turn away that business, when you say thanks but no thanks, you better be ready to explain to a community why you did that and what the importance of that is and how come. Getting them educated before you come to that point is a is a big step in, in making that a lot easier for you to say no. Be proactive. Don't be afraid of failure, but know when to say uncle. If we're going to go into this other community and say, yeah, that seems like a lot of money and, and we don't know if it's going to be successful, so let's not do it. Well, then you don't understand how economic development works. Just like in business world, you're making investments with the expectation of return. You do your homework, you make sure you, you understand your market, you put yourself in a position to minimize that risk, but at the end of the day, I am not going to guarantee you that if you follow these wonderful steps, that the golden the golden arches will open for you. You have to understand that there's likely going to be failures as you move forward, but you need to take those as learning lessons to refine and move and, and improve, rather than saying, "See, I told you this was a bad idea." That cannot be the mentality if you're going to get into the economic development game. Listen to your target markets. Adapt when necessary. Weigh the cost benefits. Sometimes it's not worth it. You may be pursuing a company that's offering you all sorts of wonderful things, great jobs, high pay, but they want something that is just morally against what this community stands for and supports. 
You need to be you need to be willing to hear it, discuss it rationally, reasonably, and then make a decision on yes or no. And it's okay to say no. This community actually has a history of saying these aren't the types of companies we want here, so we're not going to entertain that. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to understand the consequences of those choices. You may have fewer prospects, you may see less growth, but I always advocate to my clients, you need to grow in a manner that's gonna make you happy with the results, rather than having buyer's remorse three years later. Because once that building's in there, it's not going anywhere for a good long time. And then finally, uh, measure success strategically. I said this before, I'll say it again, and I'll probably say it about 20 more times before I leave town for good. Economic development is a marathon and not a sprint. If you think we're going to make these changes, implement the stuff, and you're gonna see this floodgate of investment within the next six months, well then I've done a really terrible job explaining to you how this works. These are long sustained investment strategies that we're putting into place. Now hopefully they will yield fruit right away, but to say that's our expectation and if you don't meet that that's failure, once again, that is not how most communities view and understand healthy economic development. So what's next? Well, first is, Oh, that didn't get changed, that didn't say, oh, sorry. It is except the, the report. I'm gonna be producing a very large tome that's gonna have all sorts of wonderful, great information, and if you're a statistician or a data geek, you and I are gonna be best friends. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is we as a community have to get behind it. We have worked very hard, and I wanna emphasize the word we, not me. We have worked very hard to hear what everybody had to say and build support for the goals, for the strategies, for the recommendations. I, I know that there's always going to be bits and pieces that we may not be terribly comfortable with, but that's normal. Once again, when we got feedback on priorities, we got tw 20 different actions were identified as priorities. It is not reasonable under the current investment or even under the recommended decrease investment that we're going to be able to do 20 new things as an as a economic development organization to meet everybody's hopes. And so, accept a plan, build buy-in, you need to hold sessions with all your funding bodies, and I'm, I'm hoping, Ben, that that's maybe one of the things we do with my last time here in town, is to talk through concerns, issues, after you have a chance to look at it and digest, digest it, to be able to make sure that you're comfortable with, with what's coming out of it, and then market, market, market. Educate, educate, educate. Make the community understand. Badger them to understand. Offer them all sorts of opportunity to understand what's going on out of this. Build your business plan. You saw my beautiful graphic at the beginning of this process. This is your strategic plan. I laid down a very rough frame for a business plan, but at the end of the day, your economic development implementation entities need to decide what that is. You may say, I love most of this, but I want this out and that out. And we're gonna take these two things out of the plan that he wrote about that he said we shouldn't do for three or five years. That is completely okay. That is exactly what the strategy is for, so that you guys can pick and choose where you find your priorities and implement. But at the end of that business planning is execute. And then finally, track your progress and re-strategize. Your implementation, your, your, uh, your dashboard of measuring successes and failures of we invested that for two years, we really didn't get any prospects, maybe we should think about moving away from that industry and focusing on one of the other ones that the, the report recommended. That's, that's exactly what this is all about is you pick a path, you move forward, you measure whether or not you're getting the return that you want, and if you're not, you move to the next thing. That's completely acceptable. You need to, re you, I say you need, well, how self-serving is that, Ron? <laughs> you need to hire me again. <laughs> you should really refresh your strategy every five to seven years. And now, the example I gave earlier is if we would have done this in 2006, the shelf life of the plan I would have done for you would have been about 12 months, and then it would have been complete garbage because the world had changed between the beginning of 2006 and the end of 2007. I say that to say is your market's going to change, your world's going to change, your priorities are going to change, your leadership's going to change, your opportunities are going to change, and you need to be constantly refreshing that look to make sure that you are staying with it. I know it's been 10 years since the last one. If I remember my saying that clearly. Longer? Okay. Well, my point in that, that is, is that if you truly want to stay ahead and put yourself in a position to be as successful as you can and be as effective as efficient with your resources, it's something you need to constantly re revisit. So how do you use this plan? What is it for? 
because it's going to be a large tome. Like I mentioned, it's going to have a lot of wonderful stuff in it. The implementation section is going to have all sorts of explanations to who, what, where, when, why. Well, like we talked about, first is a menu. Your strategic economic development plan will lay out all these different options. You're not going to pursue all of them at one time. Six months, 12 months, 36 months down the line, you're going to say, hey, I remember that, that crazy guy from DC said something about this. What was that again? This is that opportunity to go back and take a look and see what was what was talked about. It's a marketing tool. A lot of communities have taken what we've produced and used that to create marketing materials. Hey, Target Industry B, look at this research that was done by our consultant said this is a great reason for you to come here. All this information is your information. So creating strategies around how you can use that data to market is completely acceptable. As a reference document, I mentioned before with the menu is it provides a lot of the why of implementation. When you're trying to explain to a community, particularly when you're an elected official and you have constituents that want to understand how you're using their resources, you want to have an explanation to say, this is the reason why we think this is a good investment for us. And a lot of that is going to be in this document. So using this as a reference document is, is, is uh, very, very strategic. And then finally, it's a scorecard. It is a way to compare the intent of the action with the implementation of it. And what I mean by that is, once again, I don't want you to do it exactly the way I say because you think that's the only way to do it. If you want to do it the exact way I say, it's because you agree that that's in the best interest of the community. But I want you to measure and understand the intent of why we're making the recommendation and then measure that against the success that you're having. If the intent of the recommendation, for example, is to help people who are coming out of rehab to find jobs, is the actions that we're doing meeting that? And if not, then how do we refigure that strategy because that's what the intent was to find in the economic development, in the strategic economic development plan. So, I'm, I believe I've actually gotten quieter as this conversation goes on because I feel my voice is getting very weaker. So, with all that said, that's it. That's what I got for you today. So, to my table, I want to open up. I'll get to you. The, the, we allow the elected officials to ask questions first. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, we're all sitting here, city and county, and other people. Are. Our goal is to bring more employment in Paul County. And what our objective is with a larger tax base. We're going to have. But uh, you had recommended uh, some time ago about us hiring another uh, EDP person and uh, changing things around. It's probably a good idea. I'm not exactly so long exactly how you had it stated. Uh, the way I look at it, Jody is a real fine person, or EDP person, I shouldn't even call it tonight. I think you've been real, you've done a wonderful job with, uh, with, their, uh, with their local industries and so on. But I, I'd have to give him probably an elf on uh, bringing other Employment in the Ball County. You know, he tends to job fair, but I've attended job fair before. And I think the biggest thing a job fair is is to meet people and have parties. I don't think he's ever produced anything. And I don't know of any factories or anything that he brought in in the seven or eight years we've had him here. But he's done a wonderful job with our present people, of keeping them here and talking to them and whatever. So I think my recommendation is that I'll have a, a pig in this fight, or a dog in this fight, or what you want to call it, <laughs> is to maybe make him president of the industrial park, the industrial foundation, and then hire a EDP person who's going to go out and actively solicit employment to come to Ball County. Well, the way it is now, we don't have that person. <laughs> I don't feel. But I've been here that long and he hasn't brought for I know Zilch. We've increased what we got. But the way I look at it, our factories would have increased anyway if he hadn't been here. And I appreciate your perspective on that. Um, I will say that in concept I agree that enabling your existing economic development person to do what they do best and focus on that by alleviating some of these other responsibilities that pull them back from maybe being as successful as you want 
is what we're trying to accomplish here. Where you and I may diverge a little bit is I don't believe that, for example, when a building gets vacated, it would have backfilled so quickly without someone like Jody in place to make it happen. I think that Jody's skill sets are substantial in recruitment and outward marketing of this community, but that's my opinion. At the end of the day, the Economic Development Organization, and the, if you agree with the board structure that I talk about there with increasing the amount of public sector representation, the private representation, will be the ones who will have to determine whether or not Jody or anybody else is an appropriate fit for the economic development efforts of this community. And so from that perspective is, you know, what I recommend is trying to take advantage of what I believe his strengths are. But at the end of the day, the community is going to have to, the, the economic development organization and its board leadership will have to determine whether or not that's being met. And uh, beyond that, I think that, you know, there's been a lot of talk in this community about everything from performance to salary and, and everyone has a right to their opinion but at the end of the day it's your economic development organization that you would trust it's the people that you put on that board needs to make those determinations and you have to believe that those folks are making the decisions in the best interest of the community well, I've got a, I have a, i'm sorry to keep talking but i have a bad feeling about the county and the city both and i think we've got a good working relationship and i think we've been pouring money down the property at all I think we can use this money more wisely than what, what we got out of it. I'm, I'm not going to, I respect your opinion in that. I'm not going to sit here and argue and debate with you over whether or not I agree it's immaterial. We don't have to agree. Exactly. That's exactly my point. It is you as a, as a the fiscal court right. and you as a city commission and the industrial foundation and your, and your um, chairman's investors need to determine whether or not this is a good investment for our community. You probably heard me say before, if not, and you're going to say it now, is how serious are we about economic development? Because the reality is, is that if, if we don't believe economic development is of value to our community, we believe that this community will continue to grow economically without intervention, then, then that should be the conversation. And, and you should, as a, as a group, decide, yes, we think that we don't need this and we're not going to invest in it. The worst thing you could do is, is make an investment in something that you don't want because you're never going to get support behind it. You're never going to get behind it. And so from that perspective is, if this process does nothing but help all the investors soul search and determine whether or not this is something we want to do, then, then good. Because you need to make a decision, but if as a group you decide this is something that you want to do and you want to get behind and you see the value of it, then I would argue then let's, then let's get behind that and be supportive. Well, I worry about personal films getting involved too much, you know. I've been a hunter all my life, and the old saying is, you got a dog with one hunt, you shoot him. So we need to take that step and move forward. I don't think, I think we must run long enough without getting the results we need. Awesome. I appreciate that perspective. I appreciate you sharing that, because I think, as a community, you need to discuss all perspectives on it. Uh, I don't know if you heard, we're going to let the elected officials talk first, and then I'll go to the crowd when they're done. Mr. Cabry. Right here. Kyle, at our last meeting, you you gave us a very honest opinion of what you felt about community buying. In fact, that you didn't, I believe you said you you had seen it much higher in other communities than that you worked in, and that ours really wasn't great. And that's what it's about. Like. But so much of what you've shown tonight, I think, goes back to the need for community buying. This community doesn't buy anything. We're not going to achieve, I think, a lot of what you have presented. One of the areas that we, I think we forget, we take pride in we're a great quality of life area, and we are. We take pride in that we have a great health situation here for folks. And we've talked about being a retirement community. Well, that brings in folks who have spent a lot of years doing a variety of activities and work. And retirement doesn't mean that you turn the switch off of something that you've been doing for 12 hours a day, maybe five to six days a week. Your mind still works. 
you've traveled the country, you've been involved, you've had experiences uh, that you feel like can help where you're presently living. And those retirees come here, and yet when they have ideas, when they have something to add, uh, I don't think they find a market here, a receptible market to that. There's no place for them to go and say, I've got an idea that may help. They don't see the welcome sign out. Mm -hmm. Glad to sit down and talk to you. I hear that. Because then we become old Danville and new Danville. And I, I, I don't like to hear that. I, I have seen the growth of Danville uh, back in the 70s because we had a lot of new people who came to the industry and they came from other places and they shared ideas and they improved a lot of the things that we do today uh, that made us what we are today. And if we had been without that, I don't know where it would be. In communities that you work in, do you find a sounding board for these people who very talented, highly educated, very, very well skilled kind of people have a place to go and contribute to the community with ideas and suggestions and feel welcome. Have you got an idea of how that could possibly be done here? Sure. Um, uh, I would believe <coughs> if I'm distilling what you're asking from what I'm presenting is the capacity. I'm not making excuses, but I am in a way. When I have two and a half jobs to do and I got one body to do it with, something's got to give. And while communication always could be better, and I'm not going to sit here and make excuses for that, the reality is you need somebody who's actually going to be in the office to be able to sit down and have that conversation. You need to have the bandwidth. In communities I've worked with, there's usually someone who's responsible for that public outreach, public engagement on staff that does that job. But that's their job. It's not one of seven jobs that they have. And so I keep harping back on this because I think it's important to understand is you bring on that second person and that third person, you have the admin that's working with the organization, and now you have the bandwidth to be more receptive to that. But if I have to prioritize my day, I'm gonna do the things that I've been told are the most important and do that. And that means some other stuff falls down, falls away. What we talked about here over the next 12 months is conditional upon that COO being hired. A number of these things that we talk about that I would do with, if I were you guys over the next 12 months won't happen if I don't have a second full-time professional on board. It, it's, it simply goes back to what is our expectations of economic development and what are we willing to do to make it happen. You can create, I mean, for example, you can create a suggestion box, you can create an online form that you can fill out on the EDP website that says, you have a great economic development idea, give it to us, we'd love to hear it. But even if you provide that portal where they feel like they, it can be shared, if there's no one at the other end that has the time or the energy to read it, it's just as bad as if they say, I don't really want to hear it. In fact, I personally, but then again, I'm from New Jersey, I personally would rather you tell me, no, I don't have time for you, then give me lip service that, yeah, I want to hear what you have to say with no ever intent of doing something with it. So for me, capacity, you know, and I, and I understand it's a chicken or egg thing and I understand the sensitivity, but the reality is you want them to feel special, you want them to feel welcome, you want them to feel that they're a part of it. Well, you need to provide the staff the ability to provide that level of, of, of customer service. And that's just a reality. So for me, there are a number of ways, both electronically to provide an opportunity to share, but also as you're building bandwidth to be able to go out and hear them. The, 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 the ambassador, uh, excuse me, the advocate network that I'm talking about, training people who are citizens that can then go out and listen, talk about those ideas. They're, they're knowledgeable enough about economic development to say, let me bring that back and I'll find an answer for you. Is That's a way you can grow capacity without having to spend more money. And to your point, John, there are people in this community that are retired that aren't really ready to hang up the gloves, if you will, that may be very interested in being engaged at that level. And so, but to train the advocates, to spend the time to get them knowledgeable about economic development and be able to have an intelligent conversation requires staff time. I mean, you, know, it's, you can see how this cycle will go back and forth and back and forth. And I, we have put in community engagement because it is very, very important for you to do, particularly over the next year or two, 
is bring more education, bring more outreach, learn to hear more from the community and, and, and provide them more information. But on the flip side of the coin is if I don't have someone to do it, it's 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 an ambition and it's not a plan. Someone someone can tell me is a, a, a an idea without an action is a dream. I think there's some saying around that that's what it is. And so I, I respond by saying this strategy without the people to do it is 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 a, is a dream. And if we don't, aren't going to put the people in place, then let's scale back. Once again, let's scale our expectations of economic development to what we're going to put into it. If we're going to, it's, we're going to be a one-man show or a one-woman show, then let's figure out what one person can do with their week, and that's what we're going to do, knowing that we're not going to do anything else. That, to me, is the only way you're going to get the type of customer service that you're looking for. But there are recommendations, and I, we just mentioned a couple of how you go about doing that. The county's been monopoly. You guys are going to let them do this to you? Well, <laughs> Oh, matter of fact, um, <laughs> um, I think you're talking about community buying, and I think um, that that has to come from the top down. And I don't think, as a government, a governmental body, that we've done a very good job of of uh, building momentum for the the EDP itself. I think there's always been some controversy or some personality conflict or something that's uh, really kept kept uh, I'll speak for the commission uh, it, it gives the impression that the commission wasn't behind the EDP and I think that's that the public has gotten that feeling and I think it's up to us to, to change that or it needs to start with us and uh, I think this is a great, a great time to do that new plan new ideas let's us get behind it, and then I think uh, the community will as well. I appreciate your candor in that. I appreciate the recognition that the relationship hasn't always been managed in the best way possible. Uh, I also am excited to hear you say that you recognize it and let's work on it. Because at the end of the day, that's what the next step needs to be. It's, it's stop talking about what the problems are and start working on the solutions. And I think that has been one of the ruts that we have been in as a community is it's been very easy to say the EDP is not doing this or the city is not doing that or the county is not carrying their weight and we've gotten into this finger pointing which is counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish which is we're trying to bring more economic activity, jobs and opportunity for the people who live here. And I don't believe any partner, current, future, past in economic development doesn't agree with that. And so hopefully that as we look to rebuild the organization so that we can eliminate some of the misperceptions, we can, we can increase the amount of inclusion and everybody feels like their voice is being heard, is that can be one of the first steps for the elected leaders to take, that, to, to take on that mantle, if you will, and make, bring it home. But I appreciate the candor because I think it's important. You know, I know I'm, I'm not perfect. Uh, I'm reminded of it almost daily at my house. But being willing to say that out loud is a completely different story than knowing it. And, and that's the first step towards, towards make, moving forward. I just have a few questions. And, and I completely agree with, with what Kevin, Kevin said. We haven't been supportive of each other. And that's probably the first thing that needs to change. Um, so going back to the uh, administrative section, Currently, uh, the Industrial Foundation pays a portion, if not the majority, of the CEO's salary. So, tell me how that would work in, in, this, uh, in this way that you have it laid out. Because it says that all ED staff is employed by the uh, DBDC. So, would the Industrial Foundation still be a contributor? Yep. And that money would just be reallocated? They would be a contributor no different than the city and the county and the chairman circles. They are committing to an investment, just like you commit to your investment. And they have their representation on the board, just like you have your representation on the board. And collectively, you'll make decisions on hiring, firing, of staff. And he wouldn't necessarily work for them like he does now? 
the CEO of this economic development organization, as I proposed, would be 100% employed by the economic development organization. And so on the board, are they, um, I, I think you said this, but I, I just want to clarify. Um, with the memberships, um, are they choosing their own people that represent the table? The board? Yes. Those are the, those are the at-large members that they are choosing? The, the city, in my structure here, can nominate three people to serve on the board. And it's the commission's decision of who that is. The fiscal court would have three people who would serve on the board. It would be their decision to determine who that is. The industrial foundation would have six people who serve on the board. It's their decision, whether it's board members or others, that's their decision who that would be. Same thing for Perry and Junction City when they come to the table. Uh, the chairman circles, yes, they can nominate. They don't have to be employees of those companies. They can nominate someone else. I doubt that that would happen in reality, but it's their choice of who they would nominate for that seat. Um, the only three of this group that is chosen by the group are the three at-large business members, and I would hope that the group would look at the mix of businesses that are on there, whether they be private sector nominees or public sector nominees, and then try and use those slots to fill holes in industries that aren't yet represented. To me, that would be ideal. I'm an idealist, it's easy for me. I'm looking at a piece of paper and not picking people in the community, but that's how I would go about it. But it would sort of work the way our committees have worked in general. So we can nominate before the whole commission or to the mayor, and then we can choose who serves on that one. Yep, you could pick three elected officials, you could pick three staff, one staff, one official, one public person that you think would just be a good representation for economic development, yeah, it's, it's your, your choice. <coughs> the three at large, are they selected by the industrial? No, 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 they're selected by the board as a whole. The board, all right. So in my mind, they would each serve a three-year term staggered, so every year one of those seats comes up. So the six, nine, 12, I'm doing my math in my head, 15, so between 15 and 17 people who are left on the board, whether or not Junction City and Paragon come to the table, would vote. And whoever gets the most vote gets that business seat for the next three years. So it's a decision of the board as a whole. What do you see the mission is of the Industrial Foundation? Uh, in the short term, they would be land holding and management of their assets and an investor in economic development. So the Industrial Foundation owns property, they own, they have financial resources, they are managing their resources and they are managing their assets and they fund economic development. No different than what the city and the county do with their resources outside of the EDP. If, if, if my memory's right then, that's a lesser mission than what they've had in the past, is that correct? That is a substantially different role than it's a had. much more passive role in economic development than they've ever had. It's a substantial change. And through this process, I have been working with leaders of all these different organizations to ensure that what I'm coming up with is it doesn't make them apoplectic. And they have, and in the Industrial Foundation's perspective, they have been supportive and endorsed this new role. Of this new role. Yes. And John, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I know you're sitting in the crowd. But that's that's been my take on what how this has gone now. Yes, you're correct. Okay. Any more questions from the, the table? All right. Gentleman with the hat in the back there, you raise your hand first. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know your name. Bill. Steve, and I just want to ask in, in your asset section, which is pretty large, I like to focus, uh, focus more on assets. Yep. We can always do with liabilities. Um, I, want, I think maybe I didn't hear it or didn't cover it. Probably had a lot of experience in Northern Virginia um, about the downtown versus hotel b and section. I didn't really hear How do you think that's going to impact the annual? How do I think a downtown There's hotel? There's a section in there, reform feasibility analysis for calling potential assets, downtown both equal health and B and B. Well, I didn't hear anything much about that. It's, it's an unmet need that you have, an unmet opportunity you have here in this community. 
uh, to attract a hotel to downtown, not just have them all out in the bypass or have Airbnb individual houses. Um, I can't tell you, you know, this is the reason why you do a feasibility study, because at the end of the day is hotels live and die by occupancy rates and rev par, if you're familiar with that terminology. And I, as a community, would want to, to see if it's a 20 unit, 20 room or a 50 room facility, how that impacts that. And whether or not then we want to pursue it as a community, as a target for us to augment our services on how it's going to impact the other businesses here. Because the goal isn't to create unnecessary competition. The goal is to augment opportunities to enhance our community. And I can tell you from my personal experience coming here to town, being able to stay and walk around rather than having to get in my car and drive, there is a substantial amount of business that is driven by the hospital and by the college that I'm sure those folks would love to have something that's right there in town. Having access to your higher end restaurants that right now are generally clustered right near downtown would be a tremendous boon, not just for the community, but for a lot of the businesses that you have here in your community who's, when their executives come to visit, for example, could take advantage of that. Now, is it possible that an investment like that could have detrimental effects on other businesses? Sure, that's why you, do, that's why you invest in the feasibility study before you make a decision to jump off that bridge, if you will. Does that answer your question? Sure. Okay. In what part am I not answering? That, that seems to be a private matter as much as a, a public matter. In other words, it's like it's, you're now getting into the private investment side of your assets. Correct. And, and the, the reality is that you can only offer an opportunity for someone who owns a property to take advantage of it. And if no one wants to do it, then you don't do it. But that goes back to the conversation I had earlier about you need to talk to your property owners. You need to identify your sites. You need to find out if anyone is interested in doing that. Because the answer is no, nobody wants to do it, then why pursue it? Because it's, it's not going to benefit you. You can, you can bring in 12 different hoteliers, but if there's no spot to put them in, you've wasted your time. So I'm with you on that is you need to make sure you have your ducks in a row before you pursue that as an opportunity. Thank you. Sir, behind uh, uh, John. Yeah, no? Oh, me. Yeah. Well, earlier I was just uh, raising my hand, but I was curious. I know that in Mercer County, they have a total budget of 75000 in economic development. Yeah. So obviously, money is not always the situation. Sometimes it's just out of this. But my, my question for you is very simple. I was curious. Uh, from your experience, can you give me a definition of what you would define as uh, prone capitalism? That uh, sounds strange, but I know you're going to try to make it a political and emotional issue, but because you know where I'm coming from, so I'm just asking very simple. Can you define for me what your definition is of crony capitalism? Sure. Um, I guess my definition of crony capitalism is where you remove the uh, market opportunities of an open bid process to enable someone who you have some sort of relationship with to take advantage of it. So to me that would be what crony capitalism is. Um, uh, Mercer County's budget, that notwithstanding, is they probably set their expectation if their budget truly is $75,000, they set their expectation of what they want out of economic development to be based on $75,000. And I don't object to this community saying all we should be investing in economic development is $75,000, but then stop asking for all the things that you say that you want. Well, because I'm you're not going to get that out of 75 grand. Well, thank you for being honest about that because obviously um, you gave us a great definition of growing capitalism. That's what this community needs here. Okay. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, I'll get to you next. I don't know. You first. You're at the table. You get priority. This is like first class, man. <laughs> to, to the Industrial Foundation, don't take this the wrong way, but this is a question that I think we would hear out of this, so I want to clarify it now, if you don't mind, John. Not to take anything away from the fine work that you all do, so please understand this. But it sounds like the, their mission is less than it has been before uh, and more of a, which they do a great job of, taking care of the industrial land, uh, which is a huge job. The infrastructure and keeping up uh, that is huge. And I, I understand it. They seem to have a lot of folks at the table uh, when I look at the numbers, the way you broke them out. Mm -hmm. and I guess 
So somebody's going to ask me, why do they get the number of seats at the table uh, when they have less mission? Well, it, it um, appears they have less mission. Well, see, I think we're mixing up mission with investment. Okay. The Industrial Foundation has never been shy about what its mission has been for sure. the past 40 some odd years. Um, I think their willingness to come to the table and recognize that this is bigger than them now in terms of what needs to get done and that the world has changed and, and the way they used to do things isn't as easy to do it anymore and we need a public-private partnership to happen. I think it is a testament to the fact that they recognize that what they used to do in the past isn't exactly going to meet all the needs and expectations of our community. Beyond that is they get that many seats because right now they are the largest investor in economic development in Danville Boyle County. Um, if, you, if you look at what my definition of economic development is, attention, improvement, expansion, workforce development, entrepreneurial development, the investment the public sector is making in Main Streets is community development. It's important, it's vital, it's extremely valuable to helping economic development with success but it's not meeting the goals and expectations of what the return is, which was defined as more jobs, and as a result, tax base. And so when you look at those investments from a purely investing in economic development perspective, the, the um, Industrial Foundation is carrying the water, if you will, in terms of spending. That being said, and I've said this before, but I'm happy to repeat it to make sure everybody hears. I, have not, I do not know of an economic development partnership not this EDP, but just any public-private partnership where the private sector makes investments, financial investments, and the majority of the voting board is public sector. The reality is, the feedback I get, not just from here, but from around the country, when I do this that work is, I pay my taxes. That's where the elected officials can decide how they're going to use my money. If I'm willing to go above and beyond what my obligation is, then I want to say, and how those resources are used. And so I was very, very careful to make sure that we built an organization that maintained private sector majority on the board because I don't want this community to walk away from near $200,000 a year of investment in economic development from the private sector. That doesn't make any sense. To have to come up with an additional 200 grand just to do what you're doing today. And that's the give, if you will, that the public sector has to acknowledge, just like the foundation give that they've acknowledged is it, this needs to be a team effort. And it has to be very clear and transparent that it's a team effort. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you look at my structure, the Industrial Foundation by far has taken the largest leap towards the middle to create this partnership and help it continue to grow and thrive, in my opinion. And so that being said is the day that this community says we're going to minimize, at least minoritize, the private voice in just economic development decisions is the day that they stop investing. And I am not professionally or personally going to endorse that. That doesn't make any sense. No community should walk away from private investment if they're willing to put the money up on the table and make it happen. The public sector always has the control of not funding the organization if it is not doing what it's been tasked to do. If the Economic Development Organization, the, the Family Boyle Development Corporation, I defined it, does not pursue the goals and vision that was set through this process through a partnership of working with a vast majority of citizens, elected officials, and private businesses, then you say, you guys are no longer doing what you're supposed to do, we're out, or fix it. That is always the card that the public sector has to play. But you have to recognize that you're tasking business retention improvement to people who are experts in business <coughs> development and growth. And there's the, that's where the value is. And so um, from my perspective is, what you see here is trying to meet, meet that compromise that brings the voice of everybody to the table while not alienating one of our assets for implementing economic development. I just see that as a point of discussion going forward. Without question. The clarification. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I endorse that because as a community, you need to continue to measure and determine whether or not this is a good investment for us. As elected officials, it is your responsibility, frankly, to say, is this investment going towards the type of things it's supposed to accomplish? If the answer is yes, 
we continue to do it. If the answer is no, we demand change or we don't do it anymore. Or if you don't believe, as you've already expressed, sir, that it's worth it, then we don't do it. Not you. <coughs> Looking right next door there. Yes, John. Put the sustainability side back up. I'm going to try to address some of the questions that John said concerning the Industrial Foundation. I think if you look at a lot of the keys that you put up there for this new entity to be sustainable, you'll see that a lot of the things are the things that the Industrial Foundation either has already done in the past or does or understands how to do that. Doesn't always get an opportunity to, but we do that. And I think if you just look down the list of being flexible, uh, being strategic, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, entities that we've not accepted. And you've been on the Industrial Foundation, so you can understand what I'm talking about. Uh, we're not afraid to do things. You know, we make mistakes and we make wrong choices. But uh, and so there's not everything, obviously, but we do a lot of the things that you talked about that are on there. And a lot of our people have that experience, and we're not talking about two years of experience. We're talking 10, 15, 20 years of experience. Right. And so they're willing to, you know, to step up and offer that with the idea that, that it's they'll be part of this group and their strength in the group rather than one group. And I, I appreciate you bringing that point that I did not, that I failed to mention. That's another part of the asset that you don't want to lose is, is institutional knowledge and experience. That's frankly one of the reasons why I want to do those three at-larges as staggered. I don't want three people that have three years experience all rolling off at the same time and then having to get three more people up to speed. You always want to, I mean, any board wants to stagger that so that you don't lose everything all at once. My question is not built on being negative. No, 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 and I appreciate, I appreciate it. No, no. I, I just like point that I felt like negative. Negative. I, just, I just meant that that's, those are the things yeah. that we offer already, and so I think that's a positive, and that's what I was trying to refer to. Yeah. I, I did have one other thing I want to say, and it's, uh, and I say this with all respect, is I disagree with uh, Bill's comments about our uh, executive director, Jody. Uh, with my role as as a past EG chairman, and I've been the industrial chairman since 2009, since I lost the death. Uh, I worked firsthand with him, uh, you know, day to day, sometimes week to week, or higher at times. And I can respectfully disagree with your position and your your take on a job that his performance doesn't do. Um, I see a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes on that that happened. It's not his fault. Okay, and uh, can we do a better job? Sure. Uh, we all can. That's why we're here talking about this. That's why Kyle, Kyle's here. But I do respect and disagree with your comments about him from my role, as I said. As, as well, I'm not talking about what he's done for you all. I'm talking about new employment coming into the county. That's all for us to. It's it's the, it's the whole nine yards as far as we're concerned. Whether it's commercial or industrial, workforce development, community development. Uh, your comments were about points I felt like in this guy, and I respectfully disagree with this. All right, sir, you've been quietly well, patiently waiting. Sorry, yeah. man, has to do, question has to do with the recruitment slide. You know, whether we stay with our current economic development organization or go into one you're recommending, we're going to have limited resources. Yep. So I agree we should have a prioritized target industry list, and I'm just interested if you could share a few comments as to what the criteria was that you used to identify those as the sure. target industry for us. When, when we did our analysis, um, we looked at a number of factors, and among them are, is it an existing cluster in the community? Does it have growth potential, or is it a decline potential? Are we competitively located ge geographically and resource-based to be successful at that? And so when we looked at the broad spectrum of all the different types of companies that could be attracted to this community, my recommendation is, here are the ones we think that are going to have the most interest in locating in Danville Boyle County. Here are the ones that if you called me cold and said, hey, look, I know you guys do X, Y, and Z. You should come down here and check us out because I think we can really meet your needs. Advanced manufacturing, logistics, health service, product development. It's both like docs, but also research and development, di uh, diagnosticians, um, labs. Those are things that we think our community is better suited to attract than, let's say, a public paper mill. So from that perspective is how are we, and it's also what's going on around us, and what are other communities, and how can we, how can we build upon the, the, the synergies that have already been created. 
and I'll take logistics just as an example. We're located, centrally located, between Chicago, New York, DC, Atlanta, points north, Michigan. We have a substantial amount of the United States population that lives within a relatively close distance of us. To get something from here to there is not very challenging. Part of the reason why UPS located at Louisville is because of that exact fact. They can get to a lot more places a lot quicker. We also have that advantage. We also have a 5,000 foot runway airport that is underutilized where we can move products and people by air. Not commercial flights like 747s, but we can move executives, we can move small groups of people in and out of by air. We have a very active Norfolk Southern Line here in our community, and we have, is it 200 acres, 100 acres? That's available, owned by Norfolk Southern, right at the rail yard. And so when you start tying those, when you start creating that string of pearls, for someone like me, it becomes evident, we have a lot to offer someone who needs to move stuff around. Our location, our resources, our interested partners. This becomes something that if we pitch this to a logistics firm, they'd be like, hmm, maybe that's not a bad idea for us to go there. Advanced manufacturing, this, this state has been very, very good at bringing in, I think, was it, Toyota just announced a one point some odd billion dollar investment that they're about to do close by? I mean, that's a no-brainer. How do we take it, how do we capture a portion of that activity and bring it here? We also, between the University of Kentucky, Center College, BCTC to train folks on the technical level, we have a pool of, of labor resources that we can draw from fairly easily. Plus, this is a great place to live. If I were an engineer, I'm not, but if I were an engineer and there was an opportunity to locate in Danville, Kentucky, this is not one of those communities I move to and say, I'm only going to be there until I can find something better. People come here and they stay here. Or, and there's been numerous stories, for example, of center folks who have gone to school here from somewhere else and then have come back in their lives. I, I'm almost afraid to say who here has done that because I guarantee you there's a handful of you here in this room right now. And so to that point is, when I take all these different factors, these are the ones. Now, the community may disagree with me. You say, you know what? We would absolutely love to be the next biotech center of the United States. My response is, it's going to cost you a lot more money to get yourself into that game than it is into these three. And I'm trying to help this community be as efficient and effective with its resources and its recruitment as possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got a follow-up on that from um, I have some, I know some people personally in Norfolk Southern, not to poo on what you've been saying, but I think their strategic plan doesn't involve gambling in that way. However, it's, it, you cannot ignore the momentum that that business has and um, its importance in, to the community. Um, our access to 75 and to a major highway is what enables us to do certain things. So, there are ways to work around that, and I just want to kind of give you some, some thumbs up on how you're trying to connect these dots, and uh, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else had their hand up. Oh, okay. there we go. Um, this just sort of came to me during this discussion. Um, but today, for instance, Georgetown, their large expansion, how do we, um, how do we track those employees i mean we are a great place to live and so you can live here and work there a lot of people do that how do we go about promoting that better than we do well the, the, the most direct way is you advertise in georgetown saying hey this house could be yours for x amount of dollars and here's our schools and this is what downtown has to offer so you can proactively market to folks who work over there uh, I, I guarantee you, you've seen commercials for come, come visit Texas or come to Tennessee. It's really no different in that regard to say, hey, there's an option maybe you haven't considered yet that you can start marketing within their, with, within their employment area, their newspaper. They're, you know, as much as it may royal some of their local folks, the newspaper's not going to turn down your ad. It's, it's ad space. So that's a, a, that's a direct way. Another way is working with those employers and inviting them, inviting Toyota or someone else or the, the suppliers that are coming to be part of that process and touring the community. 
And not only are you offering them an alternative if they don't want to locate right there from an economic development perspective, you're also opening their eyes to what this community has to offer that, that they can say, hey, look, you know, I'm not going to, I may not live right here, but, you know, there's a great option right down the road. So to me, that's a twofer is, you know, hey, you just, you're about to expand. Let me show you what, how we can connect with you guys so that your suppliers who maybe you don't want on your campus or they don't necessarily need to be right on your campus, there's another place for you to put them. And then they can become part of your marketing strategy where they're saying, they're talking to the person who makes the brake pad that goes in the car saying, we're not gonna make space for here, but we just talked to those guys and I think they'd be very interested in it. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Sure, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I just have a quick question. Yeah. How and who would decide on this reorganization? Would the current EBT have to be the ones to do it? Yep, right now all the implementation partners that are on the EDP in the reorganization are already implementation partners on the EDP. And so from that perspective, it'll be the role of that board, and we've already begun that process, that conversation, and I've offered for the next time I'm in town to help move that forward, is to get to yes and recognize that this is a good approach. In reality, we held focus groups with every single EDP, current EDP partner organization, including the ones that will no longer be inside the umbrella, if you will, and these recommendations came from their feedback saying, yeah, we're, we're okay with this. You know, change is scary for everybody. I know I don't like change, um, but the reality of, of that is, is that I think everyone recognizes that there's a more strategic approach and we want to, to keep our minds open to that. But yes, the, the existing EDP board will have to determine that this is the direction that we want to go. I have not heard from any of the leadership of any of those entities no, I'm not doing that. There's lots of questions, and I know there will still be questions, but I have not heard from anybody saying this is out of the question. And I've been very diligent working with the existing EDP board to make sure that we are building awareness and, and educating us to the who, what, where, when, and why, so that I'm not just throwing darts against the board. And, and the, everyone, when I reveal this, goes, what in the world is that? I, that you, you just, you've been around the block too many times to know that's a really bad choice on my part. Sarah. The this morning's EDP board meeting, uh, what the board agreed to is the next step is for us to go out and meet with the individual partners to engage in a more full conversation. So what we're offering is we should go and meet with the fiscal court and, and have a, a dialogue about what, what does this mean? Meet with the city commission and what does this mean? And, and if it's meet with the chamber, what does this mean? To give each partner a chance to, to fully think about and talk about its fears and hopes with it. Once we've done that, the next step would be, is the EDP board ready to move forward on altering its bylaws, which is what it would take to, to, to affect change? I'm all about affecting change, by the way. You're talking about, I, don't, I mean, I know there's not a certain amount of time, but it's you should have been there. Nikki Kincaid said, well, when will this get done? <laughs> and I gave a nice, I don't know, but if you want to move to the new governance structure to affect the implementation of the strategy, you're going to want to move as swiftly as you can to affect that change. Yeah. To put it a different way, to me, this is one of the first things we need to do if that's the direction that we want to go. This needs to be one of our primary focuses right out of the gate. Yeah. Does each body have to Does each body have to adopt the uh, the, the plan? Nope. And the nope. Ron clarified this for me earlier today, so I'm not going to. I'm going to send anybody thunder. Contractually, the city has to accept my report because you are the contracting body. RKG Associates. So once you accept the report, not adopt the report, it's a, there's a terminology, very big differentiation, by contract it ends. The EDP board has to implement these changes with support from the different partners, current and future, to make it happen. I have encouraged the EDP board to adopt the plan so that this becomes the, the 
playbook, if you will, for them to move forward. I have also pointed out that it would be great if the fiscal court would accept the plan because there are implementation strategies that are going to require all of the major funding entities to be together. And it doesn't mean doesn't commit you. The reason why you accept, and I want to, I'm, I'm being very, very clear with my words here, it doesn't commit you to doing any one or all particular things. But you recognize that this is the economic development plan for the community, and when it makes sense, particularly from the city or the county, we're going to do our best to be the implementation partner in, in, in achieving. Does that? Are, it, it, I want to make sure because those term those terms are very very different when you're talking about <coughs> governmental adoption versus acceptance of, of strategies. Yeah, that being said, I just wanted to say that I appreciate so much your definition. I hope the city commission considers the definition of uh, crony capitalism. I think you defined it perfectly. And also being positive, because I come from about my dad was a coach at Georgetown, by the way, mm -hmm. the coach here in Boyle County. Dan Wax, a brother was a teammate of John here. Uh, I want to concur in a positive way that Mr. Sandman was right on target regarding the President of the Economic Development Partnership. Thank you. Uh, it is 720. Can I ask one more question? Oh, oh yes, it is. Absolutely. I'm sorry to hold them here. Uh, <clears throat> I know there's been a lot of focus on Ham and Jody on the road, and, and that seems to still be the case in, in your uh, projected setup. Um, so I want to get an opinion before we dig into this about all that overhead versus using his expertise at home. You apparently have seen that it's good to have feet on the ground and you're competing against the internet. Uh, I'm having trouble with it because in my own business, we have a salesman that we're just getting beat up by the internet. His feet on the ground really weren't doing that much for us. So I want you to comment on that. Sure. So we have something to think about. Well, in all, in all candor, Larger companies, many companies hire what's called a site selection consultant, and that that person's job is to eliminate as many communities as possible and boil down where they should be looking based on the key factors that are important to that business. So, if it's proximity to an interstate, if it's central location in the United States, whether the weather is 70 degrees and sunny every day, whatever that business defines as its most important factor. Those site selection consultant jobs are to eliminate as many communities as possible and only bring back to them the ones that meet the criteria. I say that to say is a lot of the research that goes on about whether or not Hamlet Royal County is a thumbs up or thumbs down is done outside of the vision of your current economic development organization, your future economic development organization, or anyone in this room. However, building awareness of the goals, the vision, the priorities, the preferences, the willingness for partnership of the community, both in digital and in print, and having someone out there marketing that is valuable. It's building brand awareness, it's creating relationships, particularly when you go to these events and you meet site selectors that may or may not have heard of Danville Boyle County before, and creating that connection so that it may not pop up again for four or five or eight years, but they're saying, oh, I met that person, and they said Danville is very much into advanced manufacturing. Maybe I should see what they have going on. And so not being in the face-to-face -face game, I think, puts communities at a very big disadvantage because there is value to building relationships with the folks that do help make those decisions, whether it be the company itself or whether it be the site selector that they have hired to represent them through the process. You will cultivate interest from companies that you meet if you have a clear message and a clear explanation of what you are and aren't willing to do and that this is or is not a priority for us, which is the reason why when I talked about your marketing efforts is identify those priorities and go to those annual trade conferences, for example. If advanced manufacturing is your thing, there's probably two or three national advanced manufacturing uh, um, organizations that hold annual conferences. You should be there and say, this is who we are, this is our bread and butter, and here's the resources we have available to you, here's the workforce training programs they've already put in place, here's what the state puts on the table for stuff like that, and, and build awareness. 
And they will then go also, even if they hire a site selector, they'll say, hey, I heard from this company, so and so, make sure you check them out when you're going through your process. So like I said, I can't guarantee you success because for every prospect out there, there's a thousand communities just like this that are trying to get them too. But if you're not in the game, you're out of the game, if that makes any sense. As, uh, as uh, the barkers at carnivals say all the time, if you're, you can't win it, if you're not in it. And so the reality is building that awareness and understanding of what your community is and, and telling your story is critical. And I'm not here to defend or, or, or support, but I think that if to continue with the resources we have in place, that's the best place, that's the, the strongest assets that we have right now. It is 7.25 now, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Series. Uh, I am happy to answer questions, but I am going to relieve you of your responsibilities of standing here staring at me. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, there Tom. is. Ben is holding my feet to the fire. There is one more time I will be here in the community. So uh, this is not the last you'll see of me, but it's pretty close. So good night, everyone. Take a good night, everyone.